you today to turn to the book of Colossians, Colossians chapter 3. Colossians is in the New Testament and it's in, probably in that last 20% of the Bible. So it's easier to start from the back. It's not a long book. In fact, it's a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to a group of people. And we're going to dive into a little bit of that today as we continue on in the series we started last week called Are We There Yet? And uh, I know God has some really good things for us today as we dive into that. Before we uh, kind of get into the heart of that, though, I have a couple things that uh, I just wanted to share with you this morning. Uh, the first thing is that about 20-some years ago, uh, our board of elders, which is our uh, group who kind of provides oversight and accountability to our church and to our organization, both spiritually and financially and in every other way, they're kind of that, that directorship. And uh, they as, kind of began seeing some trends in church culture and they wanted to kind of establish something that would run counter to that. And one of the things they began to see was the alarming rate of pastors that were burning out in ministry. And I know you probably don't go and, and research statistics about that, but it's, it's pretty alarming and pretty frightening that uh, it's something like 85% of all pastors who begin ministry will never finish in ministry, that they get burned out or wiped out or something, and it's just an alarming rate. And they also began to see that the average time a pastor would spend in any church was under five years, so somewhere between three and a half and four and a half years. And, uh, and that, was, that was discouraging to them. And there's a ton more statistics about how pastors feel disconnected, that 80% of pastors just wish they had a friend. Uh, many of them, 90% find that, that ministry has had a negative effect on their own spiritual life and on their family. So they saw all these alarming trends uh, that were happening with pastors. And, and they said, listen, we don't want new life to function that way. We want to see our pastors be healthy and we want to see them be spiritually sound and rested and fit and all of those things. And we want them to be restored. And so they adopted a policy that is, uh, at the time, was very rare. And now it's becoming a little more, uh, a little more accepted. But they uh, kind of established a sabbatical policy that every five years for our, our pastoral and ministry staff, they would have a time of sabbatical to find uh, kind of rest and restoration and renewal. And again, they kind of went out of the norm to do that. But the result of that is we've seen our pastoral and our ministry staff have long-term ministry. So I've been here for 26 years. And part of that was because of the policies that they adopted. Now, you've probably heard the word sabbatical, but I don't know if you've ever combined it with the word Sabbath. When we think about in the Bible that, that God said in the Ten Commandments to honor the Sabbath and to keep it holy. And the word Sabbath literally means a time of rest and a time of renewal. So for many of you, and you probably don't think this way a lot, but if I was to ask you, you would say, oh, Sunday is, is kind of my Sabbath day. It's a day I come to church, a day I worship, a day that I step aside from maybe your normal responsibilities. And hopefully it's a time of renewal and rest and worship and all of those things. Or sabbatical has the same root. It's about rest and renewal, but it's an extended time of that. And over these past years, uh, over the past several decades, we've allowed all of our pastors, we've given them the gift of a sabbatical. Even this past year, uh, Pastor John went away uh, for a time of sabbatical, a chance to reconnect uh, his own heart and soul with God and also to do a personal missions trip to Africa. And if you talk to him about it, he'll say, wow, it's, it's life-changing. Well, for me, over these past 26 years, I've had several of these sabbaticals and I can tell you, it has always been a special time for God to be at work in me, uh, kind of apart from my, from my normal responsibilities and duties to allow God to renew my heart um, for the next season. And it has always been humbling for me to see what God has done in our church at large as a result of these times of renewal. So I say all that to tell you that as we were finishing this new worship center, uh, there was a lot that we were trying to finish and get done and you, you know kind of the journey that we've been on. But as a result, uh, I delayed my sabbatical for a two-year period for us to get in and finish. Uh, but I wanted to let you know that prayerfully and with our board, they uh, really uh, wanted to see me kind of engage with that to be renewed. And, and I'm 
uh, excited about the opportunity to do that. So beginning in February, so just a couple weeks from now, uh, I'll begin an eight week kind of season of sabbatical to be refreshed and renewed in, in my own soul, in my own spirit. And want you to know that I'll be back the end of March as we enter into the Easter season. And I believe God has something that he wants to do in this next season. And part of this is the preparation of me and my own heart. So I'm looking forward to the sabbatical and I'm really looking forward of coming back and seeing what God has for us next in this. And here's what I wanna tell you though, is that while I'm in this season of sabbatical, uh, we know around here that we have been blessed tremendously with our team of pastors and teachers. I I tell you, every time like in the summer when we trade off a little bit more or during the year when other of our team will will preach, I'm just amazed at who God has brought here to bring leadership and teaching and responsibility. Uh, I'm honored and humbled to serve alongside them. And so during this time of sabbatical, they will be continuing this Are We There Yet series. And I would appreciate your prayers over these weeks. I uh, appreciate just, just you being a part of what God is doing here, even during that time. Because it's never been about a person. It's always been about us following Jesus. And so I look and think, you know what? God's gonna do something great during these weeks in my life, but also in yours during these times. So, so be praying over these weeks and watch what God will accomplish in you and in us together. So that's the first thing. The second thing I wanted to let you know is that today is Sanctity of Life Sunday. So years ago, uh, churches across our nation gathered together to set aside this, this one weekend. Now it's something that we hold true in our lives all through the year, that the life that God has granted is sacred and is holy. And so we wanna value and honor life uh, no, matter where, no matter where we find it, no matter what situation that we're in. But this day is a day that we kind of lift it up to a higher level and say, we're gonna pray together. We are going to uh, walk together as those who, who stand and honor the sacredness Uh, of life. In fact, in the Old Testament, King David in Psalm 139, he, uh, he wrote this, and it was kind of this prayer to God. He said, you made all the delicate inner parts of my body and you knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous and how well I know it. Then he says this, you watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was born. Now listen to this. He says, every day of my life was recorded in your book, every moment laid out before a single day had passed. How precious are your thoughts about me, O God, they are innumerable. David writes in that, just that little passage there of how special and and beautiful life is from the moment of conception to the last breath of life. David says, God has ordained and has said, this is sacred and holy and beautiful. And we as God's people desire to honor that. And if you were to go back and look at our missions wall, you'll see that there's numerous organizations and missions work that we support both locally and across the globe that do this amazing work of of honoring and recognizing life. From the gospel mission right here in our own community that raises up the value of those who are homeless and struggling. And we know it's an issue right? Even in our own community here, we're, we're having meetings that take place of, of how, do we, how do we respectfully walk through and provide resources, but also help and support for those who are homeless. But the thing is, is that they're not relegated to the sidelines, but we say every life has value to those who are, who are needing our help. We have a team every Tuesday and Thursday that, that uh, provides groceries from our food bank to those who are struggling and in need. And we don't wanna marginalize them, we wanna honor them and, uh, and bless them because they matter. Every person matters. The Turlock Pregnancy and Health Center right here in our own community comes alongside women and men who are facing crisis pregnancies, recognizing that this beautiful life that is still in the womb is a gift from God. And so today, we just want to stand beside them. We want to stand together to provide support and justice and our voice for those sometimes who have no voice and recognize again the sacredness of life. So would you just bow your heads and I want to pray this morning. Father, we thank you today because you are the giver of life. 
And Lord, we recognize that not just in the places that it's most comfortable for us or the places that, that we want to recognize it, but Lord, from that moment of conception in the womb, that is your beautiful, wonderful gift of life with value, and you call it a treasure, all the way, Lord, to that last breath of life for those who are, who are aging, for those who are, are struggling with life, for those who have, who have fought against whether it's, it's disease or the effects of age, Lord, we recognize the value of those lives. And so today, Lord, we stand as your people and we, we affirm that life is sacred and that life is holy. And Lord, we want to be your advocates, your voice in this world for those who have no voice, for those who have been marginalized, for those who have been dismissed, whether by political reasons or uh, by socioeconomic reasons or the color of their skin or whatever it might be. Lord, today we stand and say, we value life. So Lord, I pray you'd give us opportunities to speak hope and peace and grace into each and every situation, each and every relationship, each life that we encounter. And we pray this all today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In honor of that, I want to just uh, let you know something that today from noon to two at the Turlock Pregnancy and Health Center, they're going to be hosting an open house. And if you've never been by uh, the pregnancy center here in, in Turlock, uh, I would say that you will be, I don't want to say shocked, but probably pleasantly supply, surprised at the level of care and the quality of the ministry and the, the things that they provide, whether it is free ultrasounds or uh, STD tests or pregnancy tests. They provide resources, support, all kinds of things for women and for men who are facing those challenges who desire to make a choice for life. And so the Pregnancy Center is uh, just off of Gear Road. It's kind of by the old Orchard Supply, kind of on that end. You can look it up on your phone, but I know they would love to have you come by and see the work that they're doing and, uh, and see how maybe you can even play a part in that. So that's today from 12 to 2. Hope you'll make the effort to go by there. Well, again, if you have your note sheet out and your Bible, we're going to dive into this second week of our series, Are We There Yet? And uh, when we kicked off this series, we began to look about this spiritual journey we take from where we are, which is where every journey starts, to where we desire to be. And what it looks like to go from a starting point in our relationship with Jesus to a destination uh, with him, but also in him. And last week we talked about how we can't embrace and experience who Jesus wants us to be in this journey if we first don't understand and experience who he is. To begin to know him and understand him. He wants us to experience his presence in growing and deepening ways. And to do that, we have to be intentional about knowing him. And I don't think that comes as a surprise to us because we know that in every relationship, if we want it to grow deeper and stronger, if we want it to grow healthier, we realize there's an intentionality. Does that make sense? We, we have to consciously take those steps to do the things that make the relationship stronger. So if you're married, think about your marriage. Uh, I, can, I can tell you with 100% accuracy that you will never drift into a stronger marriage. You will never drift into deeper communication. You will never just casually, oh, look, how'd we arrive here? It's never gonna happen that way. The only way relationships grow deeper and stronger is when we take conscious steps to say, I'm going to do this. I'm going to remember this. And it's the same thing with our relationship with God. It takes this intentionality to say, I desire to connect with God and set time aside and to, to lean into him, to invite Jesus into every situation, every meeting, every phone call, every class, every moment. And last week at the end of the message, I challenged you to sometime during this last week, when you're on your way to work in the morning or you're, you're heading to class, that you'd turn off your, your radio, that you would just have this moment that would be quiet. And that in that quiet moment, you would just say, Jesus, would you just be present with me today? At work, at school, whatever it is. Now, here's what I know. The Bible says that God never leaves us and never forsakes us. So, so I know it's not like God, you know, wandered off somehow. And if we don't have this moment to invite him in. See, it, it's not about what we're telling God. It's about what we're making ourselves aware of. Jesus, I invite your presence into my work day today, into my school day. 
And I challenged you that maybe you are having some tough meetings this week or phone calls or classes or tests or whatever it might be that you would just, before you pick up that phone, before you walk into that room, that you would just kind of hit the pause button and say, Jesus, would you just be with me today in this phone call, in this meeting, whatever it is. And I don't know if you did that this week, but I want to challenge you this week to continue that practice or start it again, try it in some way. I will tell you, for, for me this week, there were several times, numerous times, that I stopped and just said, Jesus, would you just be with me in this moment, in this situation? You see, guess what? I'm learning from these messages too. God's challenging me in some ways. And I will tell you, I was standing right here as we finished worship and, and, I, and I just was reminded of that again. And I stopped and just said, Jesus, would you just be here in this service today? So there's something about inviting him in that we experience his presence right here, right now. And so today we're continuing this journey, our own little road trip of going from here to there, asking the question, are we there yet? And we know that on this faith journey, there are going to be speed bumps and there are gonna be stop signs and alternate routes and breakdowns and pit stops, all kinds of things that kind of mirror the physical journeys that we can, that we can take. But today we're gonna to take a look at what makes road trips so much more enjoyable. And it's when we travel together. Not isolated, not alone, not cut off, but with a car full of friends, just enjoying the time together. Have you ever taken uh, a road trip with some friends or family? though some of you don't consider your family friends, but you know, you were with them anyway. And so you're in this car away with, maybe with just one person or a few people and you just, man, there's something about traveling together. And I know it's not all roses and lollipops. I know, you know, people fight over what music is in the car and you know, think she's touching me, you know, all those things that happen. But man, there's something about being together that, that can just make a journey so much more enjoyable. So when I was a kid, probably elementary school, seemed like about every year, uh, our family and another family that were friends of ours, uh, we, would, we would travel together and took some vacation times together. And I remember that we would go up to the Pinecrest area. And I'll never forget going up there. If you've ever driven up Highway 108, you know, through Sonora and Twain Hart and all those, and you end up towards Pinecrest, uh, there's a place probably about five, six miles away from Pinecrest. It used to be called Little Sweden. It was there on the right-hand side. We used to toboggan there when we had snow, and uh, we would do that. And I'll never forget in the summer, we were, we were going up, and just past Little Sweden, the road goes around this curve, and the valley drops away, and it's kind of a big drop-off and all that. And so we're in the car, and we're horsing around, and we're laughing and doing that. If you're under 30, uh, you used to not have to wear seatbelts. And so, you know, we were like loose in the car as kids, you know, all over the map. And what we would do is we would go over to the right-hand side of the car where, you know, the road dropped off to this big cliff and we would look out the window and somebody, one of the kids, we would do something like this. We'd go, whoa, look at that cliff. It must be like a mile down. Now we did that for a reason is that it would absolutely freak my mom out. Because she's like white knuckled on the kind of shit. And then it was the, stop talking, you know, be quiet back there. We'd have to sit down, you know. And so we'd all sit back in the seat and then we'd start elbowing each other and laughing and doing all that. But I'm telling you, it was, it was fun that we were all in this car together. Now, a few years later, when I was in college, uh, my older sister got accepted to Texas A&M. And so she and I uh, did this road trip to drive her back to College Station, Texas, uh, for her to start her grad studies. And uh, I'll never forget, we jumped in one morning in her 1971 powder blue Volkswagen bug. And we were, the back seat was full of all her clothes and stuff and study things. And in the, in the passenger footwell, we had her TV. And so if you were the passenger, you know, you had your feet up. And so we took off on this journey. And I'd never been uh, into Texas before. And so if you've ever driven there, we drove down the length of California to I-10 down in the Pasadena area, took that turn and drove across the rest of California, the rest of Arizona, the rest of New Mexico, and got into El Paso, Texas. And we got the map out and we realized that we were halfway there. <laughs> and again, I'd never been in Texas before. And I remember looking at my sister going, how big is 
Texas. I mean, it was just the craziest thing. And I'll tell you, Texas does something. I know there may be some of you from Texas. I'm sorry about this. There's something they do that drives me absolutely crazy. Uh, They have these little, you know, know those little kind of reflector things on the side of a road. They're about six inches wide and a couple feet long and you'll see them. Uh, They put the mile markers on there. And so you're going along, mile three, (laughs) mile four. We hated those signs the whole trip. But I tell you, we laughed and we sang and we talked and there were times when we would get tired and so we would spell each other. In fact, one night, it was about one o'clock in the morning, my sister was driving, I'm kind of dozing in the passenger side and we're in the middle of New Mexico somewhere on I-10. There's no traffic around us, it is absolutely barren and I kind of come up out of my doze and we're stopped in the middle of I-10 Not moving at all, middle lane, no cars around, nothing around, completely pitch black. And we're sitting there, stopped. And I look at my sister, I was like, what are you doing? And she was, you know, kind of a little glassy eyed at this time. She'd been driving for a while. And she said, I'm waiting for this guy on the bike to get out of the way. And I look and I said, "Uh, I need to start driving, okay, because... When you start hallucinating on the interstate, I'm getting a little nervous at this point. Uh, But here's the thing. If she would have been by herself, she'd have probably hit that imaginary guy on the bike. I don't know. (laughs) But the great thing is, is that when you get tired and when you get weary and we just don't think you can do it anymore, you're not alone. You've got someone there with you. So compare those trips that you've taken with friends and family against traveling alone. Now, I know sometimes... We need to just travel by ourselves. Sometimes we don't want anyone in the car. We just want it quiet. But when you're with others, there's something about the journey that just becomes so much more. In fact, here's what I've discovered. You and I and every single human being on the planet, we were not meant to go through life solo. We were not meant to travel this by ourselves. But here's the thing, we have come to a day and age when we've, we've substituted kind of pseudo friendships for the real thing. Because of technology, because of social media, we know more people than we could ever keep up with. That, do you know that there is a growing sense of loneliness and isolation that continues to spike every year? And you go on to your Facebook or your Instagram page and you look and, hey, you've got 573 friends. Yet you've never felt as cut off and lonely and all by yourself as you do right now. And God would say, this is not how it was meant to be. And so we feel lost and left out and maybe a little out of date. And then if we're not careful, what happens is the enemy sneaks into our thinking and begins to steal our joy. And we begin to have these feelings of insecurity, feelings of isolation. And the most dangerous of all, that we are disconnected from everyone. And modern day loneliness is not because we need to have more interactions. It's because we need deeper connections. Loneliness, do you know, has been identified as an epidemic in our culture, an epidemic. In fact, former U.S. Surgeon General Dr. Murthy said this, during my years caring for patients, the most common pathology I saw was not heart disease, was not diabetes, it was loneliness. And I'll bet all of us here know at least one person, probably more than one person, who has gone through some traumatic seasons in their life, maybe of loss or pain or grief, and yet they never reached out because they didn't feel like they even had one friend that they could call. Can I tell you, this is not how God designed this thing called life. And it's certainly not how he defined this this word relationship. God has something more for us. And I think that when we're isolated, It breaks the heart of our father, just like it would break any parent to know that your your kid is by themselves or rejected or trying to do something by themselves. As a parent, that would break our heart. And I think it breaks God's heart. And the remedy to this loneliness, despite the advice that some people might give us, is not to go out and try to find a whole bunch more relationships. The remedy is to discover how to build better relationships and deeper relationships, meaningful relationships. So how do we do that? 
Well, that's what we're gonna just kind of dive into for a few minutes today. And so I have a few things I'd like you to write down. The first is this. My relationships get stronger as I model the life of Jesus. My relationships get stronger as I model the life of Jesus. If you're there in Colossians chapter three, uh, we're gonna start at verse 12. and, And I want you to see this. Now, last week we were in Colossians 1. And you begin to see who Jesus is and what he's all about, his strength and his power and his authority. We begin to see those things. Paul continues to write on, because of who Christ is, it changes how we live and interact. And that's what he's gonna begin to address here. And so as we read through this, I want you to see the characteristics that he begins to name. They're Jesus characteristics. And he says, as you begin to live those out in Christ, it's gonna change the way you connect and interact in this world. So he says this in verse 12. Since God chose you to be the holy people whom he loves, you must clothe yourselves, and here it is, with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. You must make allowance for each other's faults and forgive the person who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. And the most important piece of clothing that you must wear is love, because love is what binds us all together in perfect harmony. And let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, you are called to live in peace and always be thankful. Translation, if you want stronger, deeper, meaningful, healthy relationships, do what Jesus does. Say what Jesus says, love like Jesus loves, forgive like Jesus forgives, serve like Jesus serves. Let patience and tender-hearted mercy become your character as well. Now, that's not something we can just somehow, you know, manage on our own, but it's continuing to live our lives in this relationship with Christ. And the only way we're going to really arrive where our relationships, where we desire them to be, is beginning to see how God views us and how he sees us. Because see, relationships are so important to God, it's the very reason that he created us. If you were to dive into the Bible and and take a look at at like angels through the Bible, you'd discover this, that God created angels to worship him and to serve him. And that's what they do. And that's, that's a wonderful thing. And then you begin to realize that God did not create us for those same kinds of things, though he desires for us to worship him and serve him. He created us to live in relationship with him. And the angels don't even get that. He invites us into that. But because of our brokenness and because of sin, we were separated from God all the way back to Adam and Eve. And so God sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ, to go to a cross to pay the penalty for my sin and for yours. Why? So that he could bridge this chasm, this brokenness in the relationship and restore us once again with our father. That work, that connection is the greatest story of love ever experienced, ever told in all of history and all of humanity. In fact, if you still have your Bibles there at Colossians 3, I want you to back up just like two pages to Colossians chapter 1. And I'll read this to you starting in verse 20. And this is the message translation, so it may be a little different than what you have. But I want you to hear it just in maybe different words and imagery. So listen to what Paul writes. He says, not only that, but all the broken and dislocated pieces of the universe, people and things, animals and atoms get properly fixed and fit together in vibrant harmonies, all because of his death, his blood that poured down from the cross. You yourselves are a case study of what he does. At one time, you all had your backs turned to God, thinking rebellious thoughts of him, giving him trouble every chance you got, right? That's what we've done. But now by giving himself completely at the cross, actually dying for you, Christ brought you over to God's side and put your lives together, whole and holy in his presence. Think about that. Even though you and I were once distant and separated from God, living in the shadows of our sin, Jesus Christ made a way for us to be reunited, reconnected, reconciled to our heavenly father. Write this down for number two. My relationships grow deeper and stronger when I stay connected. Now, I think we all know this one too, kind of intuitively, that we are most vulnerable, 
that we are most lonely, that we are most isolated, and we are at our absolute weakest when we're disconnected from others. That's why, what, what do we say? Don't, don't do life alone. What kind of warnings do you see, not just in church, but out there in culture? Don't work alone and don't take that trip alone and don't walk home alone. We know that there is safety in numbers. And here's the sad part about this, is that all of us at some time have been wounded and hurt in relationships, haven't we? Someone has betrayed our trust. Someone has stabbed us in the back. Someone has said things and done things that have wounded us deeply. So what we do is we say, I will not be hurt again. And we start building up the walls brick by brick. And we may look really friendly and nice on the outside, but what we've done is we've walled ourselves off from everyone else. And we think, I'll do this on my own. I'll figure it out on my own. I'll do this journey all by myself. But you realize we are most vulnerable when we have pushed everyone away and we are trying to go it alone. Think about this. Police officers don't go into an unknown situation alone, right? What do they do? They call for... See, you even know that. You know that they call for backup because they need someone to be there to watch for things that they couldn't see on their own. The military doesn't send in individuals to handle a mission. Doctors don't go into surgery alone. Today, you're not gonna go home and watch the football playoffs and watch a team face off against an individual. It just doesn't happen. Why? Because there's something about together that's powerful. And our enemy, the devil, Jesus tells us that he's out to steal and kill and destroy us. And he doesn't want us building relationships with each other and he certainly doesn't want us connecting and building a deep and strong relationship with Jesus. Why? Because if he can get us alone and isolated, he can discourage us. He can lead us to places of depression and despair. He can lead us to places where we are most vulnerable to temptation. Because alone, man, we're just at the mercy of everything. Have you ever seen those links on you know, social media or gone to YouTube and you've watched where a lion or a cheetah is like stalking some herd and then all of a sudden, boom, they go into attack mode and they're chasing them down. And the truth is all of us are watching that and we're going, come on, gazelle, go, go, go. You know, we're, we're rooting for the underdog, hoping they'll get away from the lion or the cheetah sometime. But when you watch those and when, when they're kind of stalking them, does that lion or cheetah go after some, some, you know, gazelle in the middle of the pack? Never. Goes after one that is most vulnerable, that is small, that is weak, maybe who's been injured or who's sick or one that maybe just isn't paying attention. See, the Bible even tells us that the enemy is like that lion trying to find and trying to pull us away from community and relationship to make us vulnerable and weak. First Peter 5 says this, be careful, watch out for attacks from the devil, your great enemy. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for some victim to devour. See, the enemy wants you to build up those walls. The enemy wants you to just say, I don't need anyone else. I'll handle this on our own. And you and I both know when we have isolated ourselves, the temptations that come, they're brutal. Because we just figure like, I'm, I'm not strong enough. And God says, I know. That's why I want you to be a part of a family, part of a community, part of, of friendships where you have each other's back. In Ecclesiastes 4, Solomon wrote this. He said, a person standing alone can be attacked and defeated. But two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better, for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. So I read that passage all the time at weddings. And I've even been in weddings where they take three cords and they they braid them together. And what does it represent? The husband and the wife and God at the center of that relationship braided, woven together to be strong. 
And and it's beautiful for weddings. But can I tell you this? That passage was not written for weddings. It was written not about marriages. It was written about life and friendships and, and this journey of faith. Now it applies to those things. But it's about you and I not living in isolation, but being connected with others and connected with Jesus. And in that, he desires to make us strong. Write this down for the last one. My relationship with God grows stronger when I'm in community with others. My relationship with God grows stronger when I'm in community with with others. Isn't that interesting? Because it's not, my relationship with God grows stronger when when I do X, Y, and Z. And there definitely are things that help us grow in our relationship. But God even tells us that part of what makes this vertical relationship with him stronger is when I'm in community and friendship and relationship with others who love me, who have my back, who pray for me, and I in turn can have their back and pray for them and encourage and support them. Hebrews 10 says this, think of ways to encourage one another to outbursts of love and good deeds. And let's not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage and warn each other, especially now that the day of his coming back again is drawing near. By the way, that that meeting together is not talking about a church service. I think it it works for that. I think it's good to come together and worship and be here on on weekends to to make this part of our routine to to worship and grow and community and all those things, it's great. But it's about something more than that. Because here's, here's the deal. This is not the easiest place to connect. Because where in this time do we get to share anything personal or private or important? It's really easy to get lost in the crowd. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to confront something right here, and I'm not pointing you out individually, but I want to challenge you with something. Some of us like the fact that we can be anonymous. And there's enough people here that who will really know? And I'll just kind of slip in and just kind of slide out don't really need to know anyone, don't really need to connect. And I know that there are seasons, man, when we need healing and we just feel like we're barely hanging on. I get that. Man, can I tell you, there comes a point when we have got to lower the walls and we have got to begin connecting and growing together. You're not anonymous to God. So, so take that step. Find a way to just simply, simply grow. Find a way to to gather with some friends of faith outside of a weekend experience, outside of what happens right here. Remember, church isn't something that we attend. It's who we are together. So as I finish, I just want to just tell you one thing. I read this article recently. It was not an article of faith. It was not about religion or anything like that. It was simply an article about friendship and connections and relationship. And it said that there are three things, three things that are necessary, things that are critical to us building strong and healthy relationships. Okay, these aren't on your sheet. You can write them down if you want. They're not complicated, but they're things that you probably know. The first one is positivity, positivity. This is where we... we we get so many negative, you know, negative comments, negative feedback. We live in a negative world. And to build healthy, strong relationships, we need to be around people who, who encourage us, who give us hope, who point us towards hope. In fact, that's that passage we just read above. You know, that think about, think about ways to encourage one another to outbursts of love and good deeds. Positivity is what kind of leads us to the next step. It's hope-filled. The second thing is consistency. That it can't be every once in a blue moon, it can't be every three years, but on a regular ongoing basis, we're connected with people who have our back, who encourage us, who strengthen us. And the third part of it is vulnerability. And I will tell you, it's the hardest. And this one simply takes time because the only way to grow in our relationships is when we've built trust and honesty And I want you all just to be focused right here for a moment because I want you to hear this. This is when we feel that we have the grace to finally take our masks off and be our true self. Not the self that you've built up that looks good for everybody. Not not, not the self that's that's got it all together and there are no cracks and and you you know, it's, it's all good. It's all good, I'm doing great. But the true self the self that has been hurt, 
the self that has been wounded, the self that maybe has found healing, but you're willing to not pose anymore, but be the true you. And that's not easy. And some of you are scared to death about doing that. I get it. But sooner or later, we have to dismantle the bricks in our life and not live in isolation and loneliness, but live in in joy and in freedom, knowing that someone's got my back, that someone's gonna pray for me. And that's why around here we talk about life groups so much because it's a way to grow and connect and we can gather with some friends and family and know and love them as they know and love us. And some of you say, David, is life groups the only way? No, no. But I know for a lot of us here, we don't even know where to begin. We don't know even how to take those steps. And this could be your step. And some of you are maybe here just going, yeah, I, don't, I don't know that I could do that. I already have a few friends. Oh, then get together with your friends and go on this journey of faith together. And if there's anything we could do that would encourage you or help resource you or support you or stand by you in this, let us know. In fact, if that's you to say, yeah, I've got two or three friends and we'd love just to take the message notes each week and maybe just discuss them and how we can grow deeper. And you're gonna start seeing questions alongside with these that, that you can you know, just kind of wrestle through each week. Maybe you wanna do that. If that's you, great. Go back and talk to them today and just say, hey, I have a group of friends. We'd love to do this together. We just wanna pray for you and support you in this journey of connecting together because we really are better and stronger and healthier together. So what will it look like for you to begin this journey, not alone, but traveling together. And I will tell you this, you have a friend with Jesus, someone who sees you, that he's got you, that he knows you fully and loves you completely. Let me say that again. He knows you fully. All of the stuff in your life is not hidden. You are not anonymous to him. He knows all of the stuff in your life and yet he loves you completely. He'll never walk away. And he's the one that you can be most vulnerable with. But two things to challenge you with today. The first is this. Remember, we can't do this alone. We need each other because isolation is dangerous. And the second is our greatest traveling companion is Jesus. Would you bow your heads with me? Bow your heads. Father, thank you today for loving us, standing with us, encouraging with us. God, we have, through our hurts and the pain of relationships in the past, our tendency, God, is to build up the walls and isolate. And God, we know in those places we are vulnerable and there's times we've given into temptation and we've just built the walls higher. But today, God, we choose. We commit to, to trusting you We commit to brick by brick taking down the walls and letting others in. And in that, Lord, I pray that we would find encouragement and strength and support and a deeper relationship with others and a deepening relationship with you. We thank you today and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen.